So the grade's in. I'm an old man. I'm slow, but it's in. And so now an old man's reward is you can sit down, wet the subgrade, run the whacker, and consider yourself productive. But I just want to point out that this is six inches thick where the wheel traffic will approach the shop and it's four inches thick over in the walkway where it's nothing heavier than a wheelbarrow with a small load of firewood. Because particularly with the increase in grade, there's a pretty good potential impact when you get teenage kids driving in and out of a shop. But uh, be that as it may, I'm gonna sit here, eat a sandwich, put some water on the subgrade, and then beat the daylights out of it. So this is foot traffic back here, and the concrete will not even know it's being walked on or worked on. But when you have concrete coming up against a threshold or against a doorway or against, you know, another slab, you don't want it to curl or lift or settle or heave. You want it to stay in that point no matter what it does, you know, out in the middle of the area where no one can see it anyway. So I'm driving some dowels in, number four rebar, that's half inch. It's only penetrating, you know, three inches into the existing concrete. So it's not much. But in that shearing, in that shearing condition, I think it's probably enough. One thing's for sure, five or six years from now, we're gonna know for sure. Well, at age 65, I can tell you I am less than half as productive as I was, you know, for all the years previous, but it doesn't matter because as I've been building that shop and now getting ready to pour this concrete, it's all for my daughter and her family, my son-in-law, Ben, their kids. It's nice putting this in. And today I get to put in ably assisted, or dare I say, hopefully I will be assisting Dustin Furch and his crew as they pour quite a bit, 16 yards actually, of exposed aggregate patio, sidewalk, and garage apron approach as one of the last steps in this whole project. Pretty incredible that it was a year ago that I tore out the dog run and the RV parking pad that was right there. It has been a pleasure working here in my family space, providing something that is going to enhance and increase the capacity that my family has in their space while they live here. That's gotta be one of the big paydays for somebody who spends their life in construction. We're gonna start back here. It's the furthest from the driveway and Jeff will have, oh, I don't know, maybe 80 feet of hose laid out in order to pump the concrete back into this little patio. Two things right now. You're gonna see the ver versatility and usefulness, necessity really, of using a pump on a small pour because nobody wants to push wheelbarrows back here and bend the rebar and you know, damage the forms and wear out the crew and waste the setup time in the truck and then you're behind and it's not flat anyhow. A pump is uh, the way to go in almost every case. Second, you're gonna notice right off the bat that this is a very, very light rebar section. What I mean is I don't have much rebar back here and there's a couple reasons for that. So those of you who are familiar with rebar and reinforcing and ferrous concrete, are gonna recognize that I don't have the right lap length in a lot of places, and that number three bar on four to five foot centers and 100% around the edge is just not adequate structurally. The reason for that is this patio and the sidewalk is not structural concrete. All it is is a hard surface poured on the ground and all the rebar has to do is hold it together. The second reason for this is I know that this subgrade is harder than the proverbial stepmother's heart because I turned Ben loose on this, what now, nine months ago with a little vibratory roller. And once Ben gets on a job, he stays on a job. And he hammered this whole area into absolute submission. If we did a nuclear density test, I don't know how we would even drive it into the, into the subgrade. There's one inch minus, I don't know, maybe, maybe a foot thick here and it is tight tight, tight. And since concrete is never any better than what it's poured on, I don't have to worry about this back here because what this concrete's gonna be poured on 
is very hard and very stable. Now let me show you the one thing I did that was serious with rebar, and that is I doweled into that existing slab about two foot on center with number four bar, that's half inch diameter dowels, driven back in there, no epoxy, just driven in about six inches. And what that does is make, is make sure that that edge is not gonna curl up, it's not gonna sink down, that the elevation of the top of these two pieces of concrete the new stuff that's going to happen here and the old stuff that's right there is going to remain nice and flush. The light rebar section continues over through this little connecting walkway. These conduits are chases for future landscaping water. And it continues right on around this little porch area to the entrance at these French doors. This is just leftover hog wire panels from earlier jobs. And the reason is because this gutter drain is only leaving about two and a half inches of concrete at the top of the pipe. It's gonna to wanna to break there. We're gonna to wanna to control that, or at least if it does break there, make sure that it never separates. And one of the critical things that has to happen today is that the boys have to tuck the concrete up underneath this threshold so that it neither pushes it up nor lets it go down over time. Now the exception to this really pathetically light rebar section that's back in the foot traffic walkway patio area is the driveway apron, the apron in front of the garage door. This is six inches thick, that stuff is four inches thick, and I've got a nice significant number four bar that's half inch diameter, like I mentioned, rebar section to support the, the traffic. And in this case, it is traffic. It's wheel traffic. It's the front of your pickups. It's the front of your cars. If they ever park an RV in here or when Ben's parents come down in their RV, this needs to be able to withstand, you know, a load. And so the subgrade is hard, the thickness is uniform, and the rebar is on a 16 inch uh, layout in one direction and a 24 inch layout in the other direction. Now. It may change the setup rates just a little bit. I mean, six inches thick over here in the shade, four inches thick over there in the sun. It may change the rate at which the concrete goes off. As the chemical reaction advances, temperature goes up, the chemical reaction speeds up. But I'm not afraid because Dustin and Rich and Tom and the boys are gonna be here in just a few minutes and they, I can promise you, are gonna keep me out of trouble. This two by four is a top screed. What that means is, the bottom of this two by four is flush with the top of the concrete and the two by four is level. Now in general, it's always a mistake to have any exterior concrete level because the water's got to go somewhere. But in this case, this is just a level line. Think of it like the ridge on a straight gable roof and the concrete slopes in both directions. Everything on that side slopes to the yard. Everything on this side slopes across the driveway to the far edge directly above the French drain that was in here when we started and that we repaired and moved and replaced as we built this garage. Everything on this side goes east, everything on that side goes west. This is our very own little continental divide.
everything we've done so far has gone pretty smoothly. Because the outside elevation is defined, we had snap lines against the wall line, it was all pretty easy to interpret, right? They were very attentive to get the concrete tucked up under here, that little Temco vibrator worked pretty good. The slopes right through here are critical, and so they're going to take their time and come right up to the bottom of that 2x4 so that all of these slopes, whatever they are, work out, and all of the slope, which is much more sort of intuitive, works out going out the back. One piece of very good news is I can hear right now the truck just ran out, which means we got 50% of it in the first load, 50% of it in the second load. I hope I don't have to throw away any more than, you know, maybe a yard. But it's way cheaper to throw away a yard of concrete at 165 bucks a yard than to stop short and then have to come back and have to fix the cold joint when what you have is a decorative finish. Now I hope that here in 45 minutes when the second truck runs out, I don't have to eat those words. But right now I think the concrete volume has been just about right. So you might ask yourself what square corner bead from the inside sheetrock process has to do with flat work, exposed aggregate flat work. What it does is makes a nice, straight, predictable edge for them to edge to because the asphalt varies. It's not near as straight as the concrete's going to be. So they're going to be able to strike off an edge to that corner bead. Slick trick. Dustin turned me on to that a couple weeks ago and I'm just dying to see how it works. So right now is the moment. I figured the yardage at 16, figured I was throwing away a yard, half of it disappeared about half a yard short of starting the second truck. I should be fine, but we just don't want to run out right here because it's hard to blend a cold joint, right? If we run a half a yard or a quarter of a yard short, it's a problem. I'm feeling optimistic, I don't hear the truck rattling, but this is the moment when everything bears down on a single point. So when you're figuring the volume, you know, the length times the width times the depth, the thing that will bite you is the depth. So you've got to take care when you're grading so you have some chance of knowing what the average thickness of the concrete is. In here, six inches. Back there, I figured an average depth of four and a half inches. So I always add like a yard and a half because too much is always enough. This is a little nerve-wracking. I mean, there's some dimpling on these. It could grab some of that material and lift it, but if we're just easy, it should come out and maybe give it a slot. Oh, there, that's the ticket. Okay, Dustin, back to you. So that's a pretty slick way to get a, a straight, or almost perfectly straight, line on your concrete regardless of what your asphalt does. Because asphalt is not installed in the same way, the lines are all variable, and the edges always get a little chipped in a construction process. And so by putting that little piece of drywall corner bead in there, you've got a nice, smooth, machined edge on the concrete, and the asphalt can do whatever the asphalt has to do. And those little deficiencies will be taken care of the next time that they seal coat their driveway, which is important if you want your asphalt to last a good long time.
So in a lot of ways, you think of a of an exposed aggregate finish as being pretty forgiving, right? I mean, instead of a smooth gray broom or hard trowel finish, you've got the texture of all the rocks that provides variety and interest and beauty. And so you would think that you wouldn't have to go to a great deal of trouble to make the finish nice before the surface paste is retarded so it can be washed off to expose the rocks. But that's wrong. These guys spend as much effort preparing to retard and expose the aggregate as they do preparing for a nice tight gray broom finish. All the trowel lines are wiped out. You keep it as flat as you can. All the corners of the joints are tucked in real nice because any lines that are left on the surface before you retard the surface are gonna be visible in that exposed aggregate finish. You'll get a sand line or you'll just get something that you wish wasn't there. So you don't assume that you can cut a corner on the finishing just because you're going to expose the aggregate. At least these guys don't. So one of the things that I love about exposed aggregate finish is that once it's just about to this point, it's time to interfere with the chemical reaction at the surface. You want to do something to stop the paste at the top from getting hard. So you can wash it off here in, oh, I don't know, maybe an hour. So a chemical reaction, this chemical reaction, is stopped by sugar. I can't tell you why. I'm not a chemist. I'm a carpenter. But I do know that grandma's blackstrap molasses mixed into the water and sprayed on the surface stops the cure. And besides that, how many admixtures on a concrete job can you do that with? So this spray can's about half full of straight hot water out of Amanda's kitchen. I'm gonna put about half of it in. Shake it up a little bit. The hot water is pretty important. If you try it with cold water, the molasses doesn't like to dissolve. And so you pump it up and you try to suck the solution out. And what you get is a big old clog in your line of undissolved molasses. And it's hard to clean out and it's frustrating. So just make sure that it's hot enough that it's going to dissolve the molasses before you hit go. Well, the rest of the pour went just fine. It washed off just fine. The retarder was even and smooth and the concrete was hard enough to hold us up and we had plenty of water pressure and the sun was not out too much and so it was a nice way to wrap up the pour. It's not always like that with concrete because once that, once that expensive load of mud shows up, something's going to happen. And if you don't have somebody like Dustin on your side, about as often as not, it's something you're not quite happy with. If you stick around to the end of this video, I have sort of a long form interview with Dustin with some technical details about temperature and timing and tooling and the kinds of things that are uncertain but critically important. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work. So we're in a neighborhood here and in an effort to be good neighbors, we didn't start this till 7.30, mud delivery, right? Right, right. There are ordinances and you gotta pay attention to that. And we hate to give up those cool early morning hours, but what a blessing this cloud cover has been. Talk to us, it's 65 degrees right now. Mm -hmm. So we got a truck at 7.30 and then the other one on his heels. Right. How would this have been different if those clouds would have burned off and we were standing in the light right now? Well, the first truck was basically sold and airing at about two and a half hours. Translation, sold means in shape, smoothed up, joints in, essentially done with the handwork in two and a half hours. Is that right? right? That's right. And airing, what do you mean airing? Yeah, well, when you first finish, you're bringing up the moisture. And if you immediately you broom at that moment or apply your retarder, it can be too deep of a penetration on the retarders or too aggressive with sand roll or other blemishes with the broom. So you wanna leave it air and just let the top surface hydrate off so it gets uniform and consistent. So you get the begin, it's kind of an initial set on the top, right? It begins Correct. to take up before you kill that process. Correct. All right, Correct. I'll stop interrupting if I can. So what has this cloud cover done with that process? It's probably bought us a good hour. You know, for every 10 degrees, uh, you know, is at least a, a 30 to one hour difference. You get that? As far as how much quicker it goes. So if you're trying this yourself, and we don't recommend that, if it's a hot day, you're fouled. And every 10 degrees, you said, picks up a half an hour, you said? Yeah, and, that, and that's, a hard, that's a hard measurement because yeah. that, that's a generic number that would sure. be used across the state. 
yeah. when every batch plant varies so much. All the aggregate, all of their supplies, everything is a different time frame. Completely, okay. completely. Um, you know, we can watch, uh, I've watched YouTube videos of other guys finishing um, and some of their product, I look at it and it's like, man, that's amazing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's so much different than what we deal with. Uh, our product, you can only go out on knee boards when it's almost too hard to even float mm -hmm. and trout. It flashes, it lays there and then boom. Yeah, and it pumps the water and the aggregate segregation's a little bit different. Um, but yet when you go over to the coast, it has more Plato-like tendencies than what we have here. Mm -hmm. Right, completely different and it's only two hours away out of the same river. See, <laughs> two hours away out of the same river and the aggregate dictates a lot of what's going on inside the batch. Yeah, well, and every mix design's different. Mix design. So I know in Vegas, every bit of aggregate was crushed. It was so right. bony you couldn't believe it. But, right. okay, so timing on every, every um, finish has a little different timing component, right? Absolutely. Is it, can this even be articulated or is it just something that you learn subliminally and then react to what you're seeing? Well, you could talk about it, but I don't know that you could explain it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it does for, for the people that, uh, you know, such as you were a general contractor for a long time, there was times you probably went six months without pouring something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot of uh, home builders that would build one house complete. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd pour the slab and, and do everything else. Well, it might be a full year before they did it again. And every one of them, man, I hate concrete. Yeah. How, do, how do you do this for a living? Yeah. Um, one project I, I spent almost six months on uh, without pouring. And the first time I poured, it felt like I was doing everything left-handed. Interesting. It was, it was so hard for me to get it right, even though I knew what it looked like. Yeah. Yeah. I knew what it needed to be, yeah. but the feel was gone. So, so practice is a real thing and not just in music. If you don't practice, I mean, you get the edge is off, right? Yeah, you Until you're it. back in it. Yeah. yeah, you can still do it, but you fight it instead of going. You know, yeah. instead of walking with it, you're battling it the yeah. whole time. Yeah. Well, you guys had a smooth, smooth thing here. So we we put the retarder on over there maybe 45 minutes ago because it had aired enough. Correct. And then the second truck caught up a little bit. Correct. How long are we going to wait? How do you tell when it's time to start washing off that paste after it's retarded? You know, there again, that's not a time that you could give anyone in any town that they could bank on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for us today, there's there's little characteristics. You can, you know, here we're thicker and we were in the shade. This mm -hmm. was in the shade almost an hour longer than anything else. So this will be the last thing that we wash. Mm -hmm. um, it's caught up pretty well, but it's still a little different. Mm -hmm. Some of the first things that are sealed, mm -hmm. right? Those edges were sealed way earlier. Mm -hmm. Up against the patio where the concrete sucking all the moisture out, that's mm -hmm. already blown up. Okay. Right? Hear that? When you pour against existing concrete, it pulls the water out of the mix and it gets hard fast, or at least dry fast. Correct. This asphalt edge will pull to a degree. <coughs> the CMU is gonna pull dramatically more. And over here on the natural stone and rock, it has so much moisture in there and it's already cool. It's oh. just not gonna suck it out. Okay, so that, that's okay. So you're gonna get three different strips, you, you, to sure. a degree. I mean, sure. we can blend them with the broom, but. And it is it, exposed aggregate. And it is exposed aggregate. Uh, and so we'll scrub a little harder or a little lighter in those places. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, especially with sun and shade and, and two different loads marrying together there, uh, there wasn't much of an interruption, but if you just pick a time and an aggressive level, and you start going, you're well, going to be disappointed you're somewhere. Gonna, you're not going to, yeah, no pour is consistent, so you can't do anything consistently after to finish it. So I, I've told people, they ask, when do I start washing? And I made this up, but I said, when well, it's about as hard as the back of your hand, where you can, you can make an indentation if you push, but you've got to push to do it. Is that a fair way to describe it? Well, see, I would say that that's pretty correct for uh, when it's time maybe to broom or to spray. Mm -hmm. But at that point in time, as long as, and here again, sugar water uh, or molasses mix is going to act completely different than uh, I think on the other video we used. Uh, we Commercial. Used, uh, yeah, the Medium GP8, yeah. I think Golden Pacific, something like that. Yeah. Um, it will kill it, kill it for quite a long time. Oh. Now, as the sugar water dries, um, as we can see in, in different areas even yeah. behind you, I'm when sure. When it loses its gloss. Yeah, it's time to shoot again. Yeah. And if you just keep shooting and taking lunch and you, you could spend all day shooting this thing uh -huh. and eventually what's happening is the bottom's still getting harder the whole time, uh -huh. but wherever that liquid is, it's not. Uh -huh. So the longer we wait with the more coats, the more you can just stomp out there without okay. having as many issues or okay. concerns. Okay. You're less likely to find a soft spot that overwashes. And if we find a hard spot, you can always scrub it. You can more. always scrub it. Yeah. Good. 
Well, it's uh, I, I I'm delighted. I mean, the lines are good, and the, it's gonna it's gonna be beautiful. And so now we wait around a couple hours until we're ready to kind of walk away from this for the day. Right, right. Well, and this one also, see, in the past everything that we've done has always been from a straight line. Uh huh. So like today, we were blending all day with all the floats and the rods because the pre-existing patio had different points and crowns, yeah. which we really saw when we turned and went to cross rod off. There was, yeah. there was a distinct uh, peak over there on the uh, yeah. right-hand side. And then rolling through the asphalt, which is doing some of that, um, and trying to blend into the rock. So yeah. it was... Uh, it's, it was a float show. Yeah, it's, it was a float <laughs> show. So we're going to do another video and get Dustin to explain the, the uses of the different tools. You see him pull out his scalpels and his sponges and all of the, you know, the forceps and all the other things that this particular type of brain surgery requires. And one of these days we'll sit him down in a different setting and pull out tool by tool and then be able to show you where that tool was used in an earlier pour. It was probably 20 years ago that you poured for me the first time up on Little Room. Yeah. This guy has never let me down, even once. Thanks for watching, and keep up the good work.